right, hello, good afternoon everyone. My name is Dr. Megan Naxer and I'm an instructional designer for eCampus and I'm going to be moderating the session today. Today we're going to be hearing about emerging technologies are cool, but access to learning is cooler. We're going to be hearing first from Brian Sidlaskis, Associate Professor and Curator of Fishes from Fisheries and Wildlife. Second from Andrew Millison, Senior Instructor with Horticulture. And finally, we're going to be having an extra long Q&A for this session that will also include Nick Harper, the custom multimedia team lead for eCampus. So as you watch Brian and Andrew kind of demo and show off all the really cool things that they've done in their courses, please feel free to jot down and keep track of some really great questions uh, since we will have some extra time for that. So thanks and enjoy. Hi, everyone. If I speak at about this level, can you hear me? Yeah. Sounds great. Fabulous. All right. So this looks like me. I can pull up the PowerPoint. Uh, so I'm an ichthyologist, which means that I teach about the biology of fishes. And in particular, I spend a lot of time teaching students face to face using specimens and really active learning, hands on type of classes. And so translating that to the online environment has been something of a challenge that I've been working on for about the past five years. And let's see, we need to slideshow start from the beginning. So teaching ichthyology online with a virtual specimen collection. When I start to teach students face to face, I like to go into my collection. I'm the curator of a library of fishes, which is a quarter million fish pickles in a room in Nash Hall. It's fantastic. You should all come see it. This is some of the fish pickles that we use to, to teach the students. And over a term, students will interact with just hundreds of these. They're really, they're really very exciting, trust me. Fantastic. <laughs> and so the question is, how can we translate this to an online modality? And so the answer that we've come up with that actually helps students both in the face-to-face -face classes and in the e-campus e classes is to, to develop what I call a virtual teaching collection. And so if you go to our course site, um, and we can do this if we have time, I've got hyperlinks to all these things. But you'd be able to get into this site and begin to search for all the various species that you'd want to learn about in the classes that I teach about. And we've started doing this actually mostly with 2D images, and we've gotten pretty good at generating beautiful 2D images of these fishes that you could see in the collection. So imagine this is like opening those, those pickle jars and looking at all the beautiful fish pickles that you can see and learn about. And so a page in the virtual teaching collection might look like this. This is the northern pike minnow, one of our native fishes. It's named Tychochylus oregonensis because it's native to Oregon. It was described from here. And if I, if I loaded this live, you'd be able to click on various things and see some of the bones inside the fishes, as well as the, the external bit of the fish, some of the gills, so on and so forth, information that we might want students to learn about the ecology. And you can click on any one of those and pull up in any individual specimen that's in this collection. And that's great. This is actually really quite useful. Students give us lots of uh, comments on uh, how nice it is to be able to see so many of the, the specimens. But it is also somewhat limiting um, and in particular, for a lot of the things that we want students to learn how to do, one view won't always do. Uh, for example, those beauti that beautiful set of lips there belongs to one of our local suckers. There are many different species, and you actually need to learn to tell them apart by looking at those lips and seeing you know, how far apart the cleft is, how deep it is, how big the lips are, so on and so forth. That's the cute little fish down there. Just the side view is not adequate to what the students need to do. Um, so at least initially, we just took lots of photographs and should have showed the fish in different orientations. But wouldn't it be really nice to be able to replicate the experience of being able to pick up and actually look at that fish in any angle that you want to, right? That's sort of like the gold standard. So enter the spider. Uh, this is the Arctic spider, which looks to me like nothing so much as a really expensive steam iron. Um, <laughs> And you, pre you pretty much use it the same way. Uh, the idea here is that this is a structured light scanner that Nick can tell you much more about, but you'll pass this all over a specimen and it will help us generate a 3D model of what you want students to look at. And assuming that this works, uh, we engage many students in doing the scanning for us because it's a fairly lengthy process of generating the scan and then um, constructing it on the computer. So this is Lucy Carr, a former student uh, who is uh, working not only on fishes, but also on mammal skulls. And if this loads, we'll get a link to a Twitter post. Maybe yes, did that load up? Oh, I, I see it on my screen, but not your screen. Is there any way to mirror that? I'm sorry? That brings me there. I can do it this way, maybe. There, that'll work. Yes. 
So let me make that the screen. There we go. So you can see Lucy using the very expensive steam iron. Uh, <coughs> that's a mountain beaver. It's not actually a beaver, <coughs> but that's okay. It's still got big teeth. Um, and she is going ahead and generating a model of that specimen. Fabulous. And so back to the current slide. And so that process ends up yielding something that looks like this. And then I can go and exit out of this again. Sorry about having to flip back and forth. But if I then open that hyperlink, we will end up going to a site called Sketchfab. Oh, my browser is out of date. Hopefully that won't be a major issue. And there it will load the 3D model. Maybe. If not, that's OK. Hmm. Yeah, there may be a browser issue with that, unfortunately. That's OK. And we can find and publish more models. That's good. Oh, well. In the interest of time, I'll just keep going. Assuming that the browser is up to date, you'll generate a model that you can then manipulate in any direction in the, um, in the scan and look at it in any way. And it's really qu quite a lovely model, particularly with these very rigid things like, like bones. There's a site called Sketchfab that hosts all of the 3D scans for now when you can go to the FW uh, scan project and see lots of skulls and lots of fishes that we use to teach various classes in the biology and identification of organisms. Uh, Luke Painter sitting back there is actually responsible for many of those classes as well, so you can ask him questions as well. Each individual models page includes simple embedding code. So here's a fish. This is an angelfish. Uh, I know it's an angelfish because of the spine sticking out of the cheek right there. And if you see this little link here that says embed, that will give me a snippet of HTML that you can then very easily just cut and paste into, for example, a Canvas site, and it will embed this model in the Canvas site. And again, assuming that the browser is up to date, you'll have a model that can be manipulated directly in the eCampus site. And here's an example of two different views of what that model of that fish would look like. And if, again, if it were live and that were working, I'd be able to rotate that, pan it, look at it in any angle that you want to. And it's a beautiful fish, and the resolution is really quite good. Um, I use this to teach various different things. I mean, it's, it's a pretty picture, but what do we do with it in terms of education? Uh, up until now, when I've been teaching uh, students about how fishes build different types of bodies and how they swim, I've mostly been relying on images like this. Say we've got different body shapes that we can categorize, maybe eight different types. Here the drawing of each of the different fishes. The circles there in gray are sort of what that fish would look like if you looked at it head on. And we can talk about how much water it would displace and that sort of thing. But the models really help to bring this home, in addition, with, in addition to see some videos of fishes swimming and that sort of thing. And they let me not only do this, but I can then in class sort of compare two fishes and say, all right, we can visualize and compare two different fish shapes. Which one of these do you think is faster than the other one? One of these is a fast fish, one of these is a slow fish. Why? And you can look at it not only in that rigid view, but you can look at it face to face like this. So we can begin to talk about, well, which one of these is rougher? Which one has more friction? Which one displaces more water as it moves through? And they can do this at home. In the, uh, you can, at home, they can study it. They can have access to the models, which then helps prepare them to answer, compare, and contrast questions on the exams. For example, I might have shown them those two fishes, and then when it comes exam time, I might show them these two fishes, which are not the same fishes that they saw before, but I assure you that one of them is fast and one of them is slow, and ask them to tell me which one is fast, which one is slow, and how do you know, and try to explain that. So we're using the models for things like that. Uh, they're also turning out to be really wonderful at teaching how fishes build their bones. This is the head of a sculpin. It's a really complicated structure. And it's kind of too bad that this isn't going to work live. Let me try it once more because this is really quite neat. I don't want to slay the slide timings, no. I would like to open the hyperlink, though. Let's see whether this one works. Um, so this is an example of how we can label the models. And so it's actually important for students to be able to find different bones because some of the keys will say, hey, how many spines are there on this particular bone? Well, you need to be able to find the bone in order to be able to figure that out. I'm sorry? Can you do it in a different browser that I think you're using Internet Explorer, which is oh. notorious? Internet Explorer is never any good. <laughs> Who uses that? <laughs> let's, try, let's try Chrome or Firefox. Let's try. Uh, 
Ah, no, no, no. I'm also a Mac user. <laughs> oh. Yay. Uh, so this is actually not generated with the structured light. This is a CT scan. Uh, we also did some CT scanning, but we can now sort of zoom into this model, which is fantastic. And I can spin this in any direction. Isn't that wonderful? Look all the way through it. And if I want to know what this bone is, I can click on four. That's the opercle. So if they want to know how many spines there are on the opercle, we can now figure that out. This bone is the subopercle, so on and so forth. So much better than what we were doing before, which is showing them basically pictures that look like this. <laughs> this is also not actually that bad. This is, this is a dissected sculpin in which I stained all, all the bones. The fish is only about that big. So taking that image un under a microscope is great. Uh, and I can label that if I wanted to, but boy is the model a lot nicer than this is. Uh, so I don't want to talk for too much more here, but I want to talk a little bit about how do I bring lab practicals online. So of course the point of all of this is to teach students a particular skill. And when we do this face to face, we end up setting up these stations all over this lab and students need to rotate around the various stations to examine specimens and then answer questions about them. Uh, and so you can see all the various stations set up here with by some of my TAs. We can do a lot with 2D images. And so when students take exams online, we, for example, we may confront them with pictures of three fishes like this and ask them questions like, which two are most closely related? Which ones use a fin to swim other than the, the caudal fin? Which one's native to South America? To what family does the one in the middle belong? <coughs> Things like that. Here's another example of just using 2D images. Uh, here's actually a fairly tricky question that uh, is intended to lead them to realize that the top two fishes, despite the fact that they look really similar, are actually very distantly related to each other. And there's a couple of questions about what kind of scale types they have and what kind of fin types do they have to make them realize that the top two ideally have the same ecology but aren't, aren't, aren't very closely related to each other. But we can also begin to, to introduce the 3D models here. And so here's an example of uh, a live exam question right now that students are currently taking in this class where we're showing them this particular catfish. It's a hypostomus. Some of you may have had it in your aquarium. Maybe not, but they suck algae. What kind of fish is it? Where in the water column does it feed? Uh, look at it and describe some defensive adaptations that you see, like the armor or the spines that stick out. And it actually, we're seem, that seems to be easier for the students to answer those questions looking at a model like this than just looking at a 2D image of the fish. All of that is wonderful, but I should uh, have the caveat that there are still some experiences that still don't translate online, and I don't know that I'll be able to. Um, and the best example of that that I can give you is this bonus question. Uh, these are two of my TAs, Brooke and Thaddeus, and they really like to do extra credit questions on exams that require students to reach their hands inside this paper mache anglerfish and then identify fit, which is fantastic. Uh, I, lo I love the googly eyes, they're, they're, they're tremendous. Uh, but the idea is to reach inside this and to identify something using only your sense of touch without, having, without being able to look at it. Maybe put things in there that are not gonna hurt them. Um, <laughs> but, um, I have not yet figured out how to replicate uh, trying to identify something using only the sense of, sense of touch, but who knows what technology is coming down the, the road and maybe that will be possible at some point. So I think I'm done. I just want to thank uh, various folks, including the Learning Innovations Grant Program, eCampus, and Open Oregon State in Initiative, who gave me some funding in order to pay people to do this. So thank you so much. All right. Let's see. Okay. I'm not going to talk about fish pickles, unfortunately. But <laughs> okay. So I'm going to talk about the. Oh, I'm Andrew Millison. I'm an instructor in the horticulture department, and I'm going to talk about something that uh, I've been working with over this last year, which is the augmented reality sandbox. Now, first, uh, the story is that it's challenging to teach about topography and water flow online in two dimensions. It's something that I've been teaching uh, online courses since 2011, and it's something that has been a challenge and a struggle 
all along because if people do not have familiarity with contour maps and you know I certainly have students that come in that were boy scouts or girl scouts and learn how to or in the military but for people that have no background it's really hard to translate uh, top, topography and three-dimensional understanding of topography into the online space so that was kind of the the uh, the background and the background is that Nick Nick Harper here actually worked on some computer simulations back some years ago to try to show some of these um, some of these different uh, ways to show topography and so uh, I just want to give credit for Nick actually said hey have you seen the augmented reality sandbox I think we could build one of these and we could really show some of the um, features that we've been wanting to show for all this time. So I'm gonna play you some video clips and I'm gonna kind of stop them and pause and give a little bit of narration as we go so you can get a sense. So this is the start and I've got two clips. One is one of the more simple um, sandbox videos that we did and then the second one is probably the most complicated one that we did. India. So there's a little bit of talking to start, and I guess the words aren't that important. I could turn the volume up if that was. Yeah, where is the volume on this thing here? At the base of a steep, rocky slope. Right here, this is rock. This is a dome of rock, and you can see the contour lines down at the bottom. Obviously, when I when I rain on the rocks here, the water just pours off, and they were having issues. Uh, in the fields below where when they would have the monsoon rains and massive amounts of water would just pour off of these rocks, it would wash away and erode the fields. So on contour, they constructed the boundary walls of their farms. Now the rock wall I want to pause for one second. Now, one of the magical things about doing this is that you can actually either cut the tape and do more features, or you can f speed up some of the construction process. Now, in my live classes, I actually do do some level of sandbox modeling. Um, it's something that I've done for other classes when I go and teach places outside the university. and. Oftentimes we'll have like a one to two hour session doing a big sand pile because it takes so long to do each layer. So that's one of the nice things is I can have a short, this is a three and a half minute presentation or four and a half minute presentation, yet the prep work is quite long. So, whoops, uh, play. Would break the strong force and velocity of the water rushing down the rocky slope during intense monsoon rains. So you can see here how that wall, it breaks the initial force of the rushing water that was previously running down and washing out the fields. Then, once the force is broken, it would spill through to an on-contour swale below the wall and above the field crops. So you can see now when I make it rain on a rocky slope, First, this dry stack rock wall breaks the force, and then the water collects in the swale below in order to infiltrate and soak into the ground where it's then used by villagers as groundwater for irrigation. And the monsoon rains are tamed before they have a chance to blow out the fields below and cause erosion, take away soil. So another thing about the field design in Rajasthan, India, and that's where this system uh, is from, that's where I saw it, is all of the field boundaries were raised berms or dry stack rock walls as well. So when the monsoon rains came, each field was flooded and it became its own shallow water harvesting basin. So you can see now the field boundaries, this representation of showing how each field itself becomes like a water collection basin. Okay, there's not much more activity on that video. Um, that's, that's the basis, and that's, this is a more simple style. You can see that um, 
those lines are contour lines, right? And the topography, the higher elements are the white, and then the, the level that you have of the sand, um, the color changes as the level goes down. It's really responsive. And so I have it on freeze right here, but it actually is something that as you move the sand, the contour lines actually change in real time. Yeah, so I'm gonna show you the more um, complex video now. Let's see, is this? Yes. So this is sand. This is, yeah, it's sand. And um, I have a, a bit of, I did, you know, sculpture and ceramics in, uh, in school and such so I mean in college so I have a little bit of like a sculpture and I played in sandboxes a lot as a child <laughs> as well matchbox cars and everything so um, I'm actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this through slowly this is about a 13 minute long video that took between two and three hours to film right and we have props in here and you're gonna see various props so we also printed some of the props Nick printed the all the trees in this video on the 3D printer as well. So I'm kind of going to go, will this show me on my computer? Actually, I can probably hit fast forward. For a lot of people, if for a lot, no. for a lot of people, <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, so I, yeah, I can just go like this. So we start out, and this is going to be many layers, just talking about water flow, landform. And so that's kind of the intro piece. And then. And we start to put our buildings in. And I have a button I can press that just floods the entire thing. Right? It's very, I mean, you feel like God, basically. It's pretty incredible. And then I think right here, let's watch it from here a little bit, because now this is where the model's starting to get um, complete. not a good location to handle all that stormwater over. We'd have to construct massive drainage, drainage structures to move the overflow down the ridges. But the valley form can handle massive inundation. This whole valley is a forested park which connects these residential swales. The ridge roads are also treed, making a contiguous canopy that connects all throughout the city. Okay, so I've put in trees along a road going up the primary ridge, a road I'm going fast here, a from the bit. main going it's gonna here. Dump yes. and logic waking go machine type systems that we talked about at another point during this course. So now we have all of the water concentrated here at the base of Midtown at this point right here. Now this includes all the rainwater directed through the system and all of the wastewater from municipal, residential, and industrial zones. This is the point where we locate any more tr pre-treatment needed before the water enters the next level of the city, the city forest. The city forest is a vast and verdant forest that processes all of the wastewater and takes all excess runoff from the city. The forest is integrated with parks and recreation, forest products and management, botanical gardens, wildlife sanctuaries, ponds and wetlands, and could have all the best features of the nicest parks in the world. Okay. So, so that's um, that was the representation of a of a concept that one of the people that I referenced a lot in the course introduced in a book, and he wrote a whole book about the city forest, but didn't really have any diagrams. And this is actually something that I wanted to present to the students, but is very difficult. I don't. I can't think of another way other than making an extremely kind of uh, axiometric sort of bird's eye view 3D drawing or something of this, but to actually animate it with the water flow. So what the sandbox has really enabled me to do with, these, uh, with the instruction is to show concepts in 3D that I really uh, was not able to show previously and struggled with quite a bit. And I think it's also um, been able to teach students some of just the basics of contour lines uh, that has enabled them to see it and not try to learn it in just two dimensions that was really a limiting factor before. Um, now, using some of the props 
right? And, and some of the other presentations actually cut live vegetation and made it different scale, so more uh, closer in scale. Um, last term was the first term that we actually used this in the course. And it, it came in along with the whole restructuring of the course. So I don't necessarily have at this point, other than just feedback from students being like, wow, that was so cool. I don't really have particular metrics that show me what the actual effectiveness was at this point. It's kind of a little bit too early on um, in the process. Some of the other things that were talked about as further developments that could happen with this was that things like, so you know, these buildings are just um, Jenga blocks that I went and bought and then, and then cut in little pieces and different shapes so we could have this kind of representation of buildings. But um, one thing was talked about um, by Nick in the development that these could actually be marked with some certain symbol and then it would make them into 3D, more like um, graphically interesting, like it might make them into city, you know, actual houses or something like that. Um, also, another possibility would be to have all of this going, but also to have a Google Earth satellite image. So, you know, a satellite image, even it would be cool because, you know, Google Earth has a lot of 3D buildings as well. So satellite image with 3D buildings with the contour lines overlaid and then the water flow on top of that as well. So there's all kinds of really interesting possibilities and I can imagine a lot of different courses in geography department or different courses that really use landform a lot um, as a teacher, I could see those benefiting from this as well. So that's my short, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's about it. Um, actually, uh, we we start to run into trouble when you know we reach about like the one one inch two inch mark. Um, at that point, you you lose a little bit of fidelity, and um, you know you still get the basics. Uh, it's a the a lot of times the geometry might not be there, but the uh, the texture over the top of it kind of sells it and will fill in some of the details. So. But there are other processes that can get smaller, and we're looking into those at the same time. We had some trouble getting really big specimens too, didn't we? Yeah, um, yeah. So, side, right? so that Artex spider is specifically built for objects probably you know about the size of a bread box, um, and there are other scanners that use the same technology that are built for for bigger objects. Um, that it that happens to be the the detail oriented scanner, uh, and. And you, you basically need to switch processes at scales uh, at certain thresholds when you're, when you're scanning larger objects. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's basically the, there's, there are limits to what, what it can do uh, just that are just kind of inherent in the, in the way that it scans things. Yeah? Um, that Artex Spider, is that eCampus as equivalent? Yeah, it's eCampus equipment, and then uh, and then Brian, you got the grant, and we basically partnered up, partnered up at that point, and uh, and went over there, and it it stays most of the time over in your lab, but um, but yeah, it's a it's an eCampus purchase. Can I use it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we can we can certainly discuss it. Yeah, it's definitely uh, something that that we can we can work with you on. The other part of the muted equipment is a pretty powerful computer to handle the models with the rendering. I mean, it's not as expensive as the, the scanner is, but it also doesn't have a cheap piece of equipment. Right. I'm just thinking that the photo of the thing, Brian, I was going to ask you about that, um, because we sort of see mm -hmm. how that works now, like dead lines or just blank or nothing. So in other words, you, you need to follow up with the computer or just, or just come in together and process and bring your data yeah. in real time. And, or at least that's what it looked like, at least when yeah. you know, the picture was taken. I mean, the process of scanning is about yeah, yeah, you know, uh, it definitely depends on on the model and and the circumstances. You know, uh, certain certain models lend themselves to scanning and certain don't. Uh, reflective surfaces are troublesome. Uh, models that are flexible are a little more a little harder to scan than than rigid bone structures. Um, but if everything's 
everything's ideal, then you're looking at probably an hour to two hours, start to finish, to have a, have a, a really nice scan. Um, in the back, I guess, first. Um, like yeah, well, I mean, all of the all of the tech is Nick, really. So as far as the you know being able to bring in satellite and um, that would be you know I'm I'm just the I'm just the user, so um, and I haven't connected with the geography department, but it seems like I, I, another thing I wanted to say is that they basically set this up in a closet, right, and then had the whole thing automated where I was doing my my cue cards with a foot pedal and operating things and so it was like they just set me in there all day and I could just do my own and they would come and just check on the cameras and such and so I just want to say that the the user friendly like as long as the closet was open mm -hmm. then I could be in there and do the filmings well and this was this was all put together right before we moved so we're out at the foundation building right now um, but so it's, it's kind of mothballed for the moment until we get back into the library, and so it's actually in a closet in the library uh, <laughs> waiting. We have a set box in the office. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, there's, I, I, they exist all over the place. It's an open source project. Uh, UC Davis, I think, is the originator of the project. And so um, I, I saw it on a website one time. Uh, it was, I'm sure, a BuzzFeed article or something like that, and uh, basically realized that I had all the equipment, all the, the Xbox Connect, and and you know a couple of different things to put it together. And we talked about it for probably maybe a year or so before it actually got built. And then uh, and then Drew uh, Drew Olson. I don't know if he's in the room, but he's a videographer for eCampus. He uh, he and I worked together, and he built basically all the um, all the structure to the actual sandbox, and then uh, and then I worked to kind of put together the software side of it. But yeah, it is an open source project, and you, they do exist all over the place. I know the engineering building has one in their front office, um, but yeah, it's a, there's a lot there's a lot of potential there being open source to do a lot of different things. So we we are looking into it, but it's kind of on hold. For, uh, for accessing the, the the scans or the um, the sandbox. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, well the the scans the scans are essentially you know their their video game assets or their objects that can you can take them in a lot of different directions and so once they exist like the Sketchfab site is open to all it's uh, you could go there right now and uh, it's it, it's not behind any kind of wall of any kind. Um, and once those models exist, we can we can put them into mobile apps, which may or may not you know work for everybody. But we can also put them into desktop apps, and and so it I guess it depends on what your application is, whether or not there's issues with access. But we can uh, we can certainly work around most use cases. Just to also fill that in, uh, there's the models are freely available, and the embed code in Sketchfab will put them directly into a Canvas site with no additional cost to the student, assuming that the student's browser is up to date and apparently not <laughs> IE. <laughs> they will work just fine. And so I've, I've, I've worked with them in Safari, I've worked with them in Firefox, Chrome, um, and so it's really just a matter of 10 seconds just to load. The the 3D models are, are fairly big uh, when they first are are put together. The you know they come in at high resolution. Those the ones that are on Sketchfab are you know some of them are several million polygons, uh, and so they they do take up a fair amount of space. Um, but because they are you know like just 3D models, there are a lot of optimi optimization software pieces that we can that we can run on them and uh, and potentially knock them down to something a little more reasonable. I 
had not yet had a student until we got those stamps loaded during an exam at the Netherlands at Lund. And there are different issues that occasionally have to pop up with access, but so far I haven't had that technology fail with public accounts. I mean, I would say um, I have specific assignments, like for students to map the watershed they're doing a design that their design site is in. And that's been one of the most challenging things for people that don't have a background in reading the landscape or, or contour lines topography. So for me, if the students, if this helped them to better do that assignment where they could map their own watershed and understand how to read a contour mapping, that's one metric that would be really distinct. And then with a lot of the design stuff, it kind of gets, it gets into their final design projects and the quality of those. I mean, that's hard to necessarily have like a really clear metric for like, are their designs better? But um, I have a number of instructors, so I teach through PACE as well. I have another number of instructors I work with um, on the course that you know directly feedback with students. And so I kind of get a sense from my instructor pool of how people are doing. So that, that would be my closest like easy metric. A really good question, um, and I think that my response to it is, in, at least in terms of assessment, is that it will allow me to do a truer assessment of whether a student has actually learned something or whether there is a barrier preventing their learning because they don't have access to the same information that a student with access to a physical object does. Um, and for, for example, I will occasionally get students that get questions wrong on an exam, I think not because they don't understand the material, uh, but because the um, the image that I gave them got in the way. So like, well, I, I knew that that fish had a big warble fin, but I couldn't see it, and so you, but you gave me. Um, so this will at least um, remove the barrier of they can only look at the fish in the way that I told them to look at it, but this is the only image that I gave them. You have an image that they, that they can manipulate and, and change and look at how they want to look at it. I think that opens access to more learning styles or at least equalizes opportunities. And certainly I could take that question in the area of having these uh, scans available online makes the class available to students that otherwise would have no class whatsoever. It also opens opportunity to students that are take, perhaps taking the class face to face, but live in Salem or live in Portland and don't have the time to come down to spend extra time in the lab. Like we do open the lab, you know, here's some time that you can come in and look at these specimens. But that works for some students, but some students have families, they work, they live elsewhere. And so this is a great equalizer. It's like, here's a set of stuff that all of you can look at on your own time. If that's three in the morning, great. It's not when I would look at it, so <laughs> go wild. Thank you, Dr. Moore, for the link. But I was wondering, um, our labs have a lot to do with human community and the idea of human community. And so I was wondering if um, we have any you know, augmented reality tools or Well, I know that we've talked about it, and we've talked about with like anatomy and physiology, uh, kind of scanning, you know, specimens that we have on campus and and that type of thing. Um, I know that a lot of this has a lot of overlap with things like motion capture, and uh, you know, these are three D objects, and three D objects exist in a lot of different ways, and can be manipulated and animated. Um, I see the scanning is just kind of like one one side of that. Uh, you know, I know that your department is working with motion capture data, and I think that that 
can somehow be incorporated at some point. We haven't done anything that I can point to at this point, but um, I know, again, back to the video game asset part, um, in new media we had a, uh, a, a big motion capture lab and there was a lot of opportunity to, to try and like combine 3D models, 3D scans, and animation, and uh, you know, real life animation. And yeah, I think, I think all this stuff just falls into the same bucket and it's just kind of a matter of sorting it out. And, and we'll get there. If you, if you have an interest in, in, in something that maybe is, is difficult to, to teach or a concept that's difficult to grasp, especially online, like that's where we're, we're trying to look to innovate with this stuff. And I think that we can, we can probably work with what you already have and probably come up with something new. Yeah, I've only run the course once since I, since I introduced these, um, and I would just say a, a positive response. I mean, I haven't gotten like a really detailed, you know, synopsis, but more like, wow, the sandbox videos. That was really that was a really great part of the course. Just, you know, more like smaller comments of people just saying that that was helpful. Um, I hope that over time now, because I'm running the course through Pace right now again, I run it pretty frequently. I'll get a lot more of a metric. For me, like I said, I also reorganized the whole course at the same time I introduced these videos. So I have so many moving parts right now that it's hard to distinguish what's what. But I think once it settles out, I'll have a pretty a fair idea. But. That's such a good question. Um, and I think the answer that I get from my students about that uh, has two parts. One of them is, I can't believe how exciting and good all of this is. You know, the, the 2D images are so crisp and clear, it's wonderful, I can turn the fish around. Uh, the skeletons in particular, they all love that. Uh, so that's wonderful, but then it usually goes into, but it's still not enough, or we still want more, or it's still not as good as being there with you and actually having all the stinky fish pickles <laughs> to enjoy it all, all, all of their glory. Um, and so I think that, that tells me that we've come a long way and we're making it happen but that these students that are taking this fully online aren't getting quite the same experience yet that students face-to-face -face are. And that's frustrating, but it's at least some of the online students, but encouraging to, 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 to different, different ones, or in some cases, even the same ones. Well, um, like I said, I think that uh, I think all this stuff has a fair amount of overlap, and I think that there's there's things that we haven't really attacked at all, and a lot of that has to do with animation and locomotion and, and that type of thing. Um, I I foresee the scans and and like uh, the the animations that go along with them. I see those working as as additional fields in existing databases, and I think that. We can start kind of uh, filling those out a little bit more, and I think that um, I know that you've worked with with other institutions for some of the CT scan data, and I think that as long as we kind of push those networks between uh, museums and universities and, and everyone who has these collections, mm -hmm. we can start bringing them together as as a larger collection that uh, you know is searchable around the world. So. Uh, I just see it getting bigger and bigger and, and getting more buy-in. And I think that uh, once that starts really taking off, then everyone will be contributing and it will just get you know, faster and faster. Well, that's just adding to that. I'm Nick Burns, one of the colleagues at Smith Parker. And something uh, Nick's been discussing with me over the last few months is, as he was saying, this is the initial like data gathering phase. All we have is the scan. So now, how, how do we actually turn it into an assignment, some sort of participa uh, participatory activity where uh, students can put an annotations on it and use it in quizzes and, and 
take kind of what Canvas offers, but make something that can actually take data of this type in this form and make it much more interactive in the course rather than just an artifact that we link out to and say at your own pace, go enjoy it, um, but actually make it you know part of the part of the actual assignments or quizzes and measure their participation and and activity. So that's something that that we've been brainstorming how to do um, with with what's on Sketchpad and and what what we're doing.